Okay, so um, what, again, I said start with say okay. What I'm going to start with, um, and this will probably do most of today's three hours of lectures, is I'm going to revisit what we did last term, because hopefully you haven't forgotten everything over that three-week break, but just a bit of refresher, maybe you had it too good a time, and uh, we have to refresh it. So some of this may be a bit basic, some of it may be sort of teaching my granny to set X, okay? but it's always worth it just to have a, a refresher of this. So what I'm going to do is have a look at term one consolidation. And I'm going to start very, very sort of almost GCSE, prior to GCSE level, um, Cartesian coordinates and coordinate systems. Absolutely vital in computer graphics. Everything we do in graphics is about having or defining something on the screen. Uh, so therefore, coordinate systems are vital. Uh, essentially, what a coordinate is, is a definition of a position, which is a sign difference along an orthogonal number line. What does orthogonal mean? Well, in terms of geometric speaking, what does orthogonal mean? It was a good Christmas break, wasn't it? <laughs> Any, if I have two orthogonal lines, what can you tell me about the angle between those two lines? 90 degrees, yeah, so the orthogonal, 90 degrees. For example, you can see I've got an X and Z axis there, they're orthogonal. Number lines are called axes. <laughs> um, are you familiar with this sort of notation? Okay, R in that sort of black, what we call a blackboard font, that basically means the real numbers. R3 means 3D space. Like X, Y, and Z coordinates. And therefore, we have what we call a three tuple. So three numbers in an ordered tuple. So each of those numbers say, okay, whatever that number is, goes to X, it's that distance along the X number line from zero. Now, to confuse things slightly with graphics, there are two possible configurations with Cartesian coordinates. Um, I'm going to start with the, I should have put these on the other side, the other way around. I put the right hand system on the left, and the left hand system on the right. I've just noticed that. Oh well. The reason I'm going to start with the right hand system is this is the one which most people tend to use. So if you hand, hold out your sort of right hand in front of you, Palmer, I don't see anyone doing it yet. Okay, your thumb extends so it's 90 degrees from your pointy finger. Your thumb is the X coordinate. Your index finger is the um, Y coordinate. And be very careful to raise your middle finger is the Z coordinate. What we call the right hand coordinate system. Thumb is X, pointy finger is Y, middle finger is Z. So usually we tend to say, okay, X and Y are on the horizontal. That's the most common. In graphics, we use a left hand system. Okay, with the left hand, if you put your palm out in front of you, that speaks to the hand. Okay, the thumb is still the X, index finger is still the Y, but then extend the middle finger forward, that's the left hand system. Okay, so, I mean, you can sort of twist it around and do all that. Okay, in graphics, get used to using the left hand coordinate system, okay, because X is on the horizontal, Z is on the horizontal, Y is pointing straight up. The reason being is because when we deal with screens, your coordinates on your screen are X and Y, so Y goes vertically. Z goes into the screen along the horizontal. Okay, so that's left and right. We're going to use the left hand coordinate system. Okay, um, and just to confuse things a little bit more, we use what we call homogeneous coordinates or homogeneous, I don't quite know how to pronounce it. Okay, so homogeneous coordinates, and they're in this form. So if we have uh, in R3, we have a four tuple. Okay, so we have X, Y, Z, and then we have some other number, and I call it W. <coughs> um, 
Um, and we relate these to our Cartesian coordinates. So if x prime, y prime, and z prime are Cartesian coordinates, and x, y, z, and w are homogeneous coordinates, we have this relation. <coughs> so you can see all we're doing, we're, we're dividing x, y, and z by whatever that fourth number is. That's how to convert between homogeneous and Cartesian coordinates. Now when, when w is equal to 1, we just divide it by 1, so we just have x, y, z. So we often use w equals 1 for simplicity. So that sort of begs the question, why use homogeneous coordinates? Well, they're used to allow us to perform, to use matrices to perform transformations. Okay. We can actually do scaling and rotation without using homogeneous coordinates, but when it comes to translation, we need that fourth number. And also, it's used for um, projection as well, when we start dealing with, with projection. Vectors. I told you I was going to go uh, still from the basics. Okay, a vector is an object that has a length, otherwise known as a magnitude, and a direction. Um, and vectors in graphics are also fundamental. They're just like they're like um, coordinates in how sort of fundamental they are. Uh, just to Quick note, and you're all familiar with this doing your um, doing your assignments. In print, vectors are denoted by the bold character A. Uh, sorry, bold character. Just the bold character. So, for example, a vector A is in bold. It could be B, C, B, etc. Or if you're doing it by hand, an underscore under the A. Okay. In fact, that's actually the more correct version. The reason why we do it in bold is because when in the olden days, when, when, when before we had computers, imagine that. Before we had computers, mathematicians would write down their maths, give it to the printers, and the printers would then typeset it. Unfortunately, in printing, when you underline something, it means could, please put this in bold. So the mathematicians would write down all their vectors, vectors underlined, give it to the printers, printers would typeset it. Give it back to mathematicians. Mathematicians go, why, why is it in bold? I want it to underline. So we, we lost the argument there. Mathematicians lost the argument, printers won. So that's why we do it in bold. Um, and a vector is simply defined by the sign distance along each of the axis by a tuple. Okay, so for example, this is just in 2D space. Okay, there's a vector. That's the tail of it, the bit without the arrowhead. That's the head, the bit with the arrowhead. And the arrowhead denotes the direction it's pointed in. And uh, so the distance between the head and the tail along one dimension, in this case it's A1, and along the other direction dimension is A2. Quite simple stuff. Okay, uh, magnitude. So the magnitude of the vector is simply how distance between the tail and the head. And we use what we call a vector norm to calculate this. Okay, you may sort of, for example, the vector norm of um, a 2D vector is Pythagoras and okay, um, This is not the only vector norm, this actual is known as the Euclidean norm. So all you do is you take each number in your tuple, square it, add them together, and then square it the result. So the magnitude is actually known as Euclidean norm, vice versa. So, Simple example of a vector which is 3, 4, and 0. So 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 0 squared is uh, 9 plus 16 plus 0 is 25. Root 25 is obviously 5. Okay, so that's the, the magnitude. Uh, a unit vector is a special vector denoted by a little hat above the vector. You can see there's a little hat there. And a unit vector is any vector with a magnitude of 1. Okay, so if you want a vector which points in the same direction as A, all we do is divide A by its magnitude. So its magnitude here was 5. If we divide A by 5, we get a unit vector. So this vector here points in the same direction as this one, except it's got a magnitude of 0. It's very, very useful. Okay, it means we can then scale that vector 
by any sort of scalar simply by multiplying by a number. I know, sorry. There we go. Okay, um, I, I've sort of missed out vector addition and multiplication, multiplication by scalar. It's fairly, fairly sort of rudimentary, so I won't talk about that. What I will talk about is dot and vector, uh, dot and cross products, um, which are hugely important in graphics. So a dot product, often known as a scalar product. The reason it's known as a scalar product is the result is a scalar, i.e. a number. So if you have two vectors, A and B, the block dot product denoted A dot B, it returns a number. So if you ever get a vector, you know you've gone wrong somewhere. And a couple of way, few ways to actually define the dot product. Okay, the, the geometric definition is this. So the dot product between A and B is a magnitude of A times a magnitude of B times a cosine of this angle here. So whatever the angle between A and B is. That, in graphics, is incredibly useful because we do deal with angles a lot. And you've already seen this for your term one assignments. Now, cosine is an expensive calculation. Um, when we get on to rasterization, I'll mention how, in graphics, we need things to be as simple as possible, as efficient as possible. If you're messing about calculating sines and cosines, um, your graphics application is going to run really, really slowly. It's going to be unusual. Unusable. So we often use this dot product in place of the cosine. You can just rearrange this, divide both sides by um, magnitude of A times magnitude of B, and we've got our co cos theta. Okay, so the way the where the first one's used is mainly to get rid of the um, cos calculation. What's also involved in um, intersection, line and plane, or uh, intersection. That's one way, that, well that's a definition, but we don't really calculate the dot product using that one. We actually calculate it using the algebraic definition, which is simply you take the corresponding numbers in the vector, multiply them together, and add them all up. Quite simple. So just combination of multiplication and addition. So that's a dot product. Okay, so that returns a scalar to other type of uh, product is the vector product, often known as a cross product. And the reason it's known as a cross product is because it's just denoted by a cross. Okay. And this, the cross product of any two vectors returns another vector that is perpendicular to the plane that those two vectors lie on. Okay, so, uh, and it's calculated using this determinant. So here we have uh, A cross B. Um, cross product exists really only in um, R3, in three-dimensional space. Okay. Um, so to calculate the cross product, you form a three by three matrix. The top row are what we call the basis vectors I, J, and K. Now they're unit vectors which point in the X, Y, and Z direction respectively. Then you list the A vector in the second row and the B vector in the third row. To calculate the determinant. I'm assuming you know, or you do know how, how to do that. Okay. Um, cross product is very, very useful. Um, mainly, the use mainly in, in calculating what we call a normal vector. Sure. <coughs> Okay, um, brings on MATLAB commands. I mean, it did occur to me once I have MATLAB on here. So, well, I could sort of, and I recommend this. Uh, so there was my A vector. If I just, um, type it in. That's defining my vector. Notice the square, square brackets defines an array. And what I can do is, I can calculate the magnitude of A quite simply by using what we call the norm command in MATLAB. Okay, remember, remember I said the magnitude is another, well, is actually the Euclidean norm. But in MATLAB, norm A just gives you magnitude. And if I wanted the uh, unit vector, I just divide A by the norm of A, bang, in the unit vector. 
Whenever, I, whenever we set these um, assignments, we're not expecting you to actually do these by hand. Like, when I write out the solutions, I, I, I never get a calculator out and do it pen and paper. I just go straight to MATLAB. Okay. You've, you've, you've been tested on this last year, okay, in your first year. We know you can do this. MATLAB is a tool. If you get to use the tool, if you get to sort of friendly with the tool, with the to say it saves you a hell of a lot of effort. And that especially applies to next year. In the final year, you'll be doing MATLAB a lot. Okay, so that's uh, uh, the norm of the uh, vector. If I type in another vector, okay, I could do the dot product between A and B. And if I just make up another vector, I don't know what it is. But... And you can easily do the cross product. Okay, MATLAB will throw it out very, very quickly. So, whereas I did say on the slide that the uh, cross product was a determinant, I never, ever, well, rarely bother actually doing that. I'm lazy. Most mathematicians are lazy. Use the tools available. <coughs> okay, so that's fundamentals, coordinates, um, and vectors. Uh, this brings us on to polygons. Now, in three dimensional sort of graphics, which obviously most of the uh, graphics applications nowadays are, we deal with polygons. Okay, and polygons are flat two dimensional areas bounded by a closed curve. And the edges of your polygon are straight lines, so these are called edges, which join vertices. Okay. Um, polygons ha can have three or more edges, but for simplicity, in real life practical applications of graphics, we tend to only use triangles. Because triangles make things a lot simpler when we're dealing with lighting, clipping, as we'll see um, later on today and next week, and hidden surface removal. So usually in the practical applications, we always use triangles. In this unit, well, we could use um, quadrilateral polygons or five-sided polygons or six-sided. So we're not going to do. We're not going to constrain ourselves to just triangles. And the reason why triangles are also uh, preferred is because they're always convex. Polygon is one where between any two points within the polygon, if I draw a line between those two points, it doesn't cross an edge. Okay, so if, if you had a non-convex polygon, okay, it would be possible to draw a line between two interior points of the polygon and it to go outside of it. They're generally avoided in graphics because they cause problems. Okay. Um, Normal vectors. Okay. Normal vector is simply uh, normal vector to a polygon is a vector that points in a perpendicular direction to the uh, plane that the polygon lies on. So remember, a polygon is always a two-dimensional shape. It must be able to lie on a two-dimensional plane. So as we've seen, the cross product between two vectors gives us a perpendicular uh, vector. So that's how we calculate the normal vector. So usually a polygon is defined by its vertices, V1, V2, V3, etc. Those are just either coordinates in space or position vectors, which is pretty much the same thing. And what we do is we need an edge, or we need a vector which lies on the plane that that polygon is on. So the easiest way to do that, just subtract sequential vertices, okay? So if I take the second vertex minus the first vertex, that gives me one of my um, vectors, for example, A down there. And if I take the third vertex minus the second one, that will give me my other vector. I could have done V3 uh, three minus V1 or V4 minus V2. I could have done any combination, but I've done it in this order for a reason. Now that reason is, in graphics, we want the normal vector to be unique. Okay. There are two possible normal vectors for any polygon. So in this diagram down here, I could have a normal vector pointing straight up, 
if you imagine this photo here is on a sort of horizontal <coughs> surface, or equally and just as valid, I could have my normal vector pointing straight down. But ambiguity is not, we don't like things being ambiguous. Okay, we want them to have a unique, each polygon to have a unique vector. So what we do is we assume an anti-clockwise ordering of our vertices. So if you want the, if the normal vector, you want it facing towards you when you look at the polygon, you label your vertices in an anti-clockwise order. Then, using this, your normal vector will always face towards you. If, alternatively, you did them in a clockwise order, like we've done there, let's say we're looking down on that polygon, we've done it in a clockwise order, the normal vector will point away from you. That's not normally a problem with things such as um, intersection. When it comes to what we call hidden surface removal and lighting, that does become an issue. So we always need the normal vector pointing in a particular direction. If it ever does point in the wrong direction, all you do is just reorder the coordinates the other way around. That sort of makes sense? Okay, so I think we'll just finish off this session with just a reminder of the transformations which we use. Okay, um, there are three main transformations we use, scaling, translation, and rotation, but there are also things like reflection and other things. Um, if you go on to perhaps the Achilles project next year, Quaternions, you'll deal with a lot of these, but the graphics, you just use three main translations. Uh, the first one, the uh, most simplest, is translation. It's basically moving something from one place to another. Um, so let's say we've got a point here and we want to move it up here and that so our start point or our end point is given by the vector t. Okay. This at the as it stands here, this is just one point. I could apply this to a million points. Okay, it shouldn't um, if I want all of my million points to be translated by the same vector, I could also apply this. So we for this we need homogeneous coordinates. So here I have x, y, z, and 1, okay, and this is my um, translation matrix. Okay, you can see, essentially, it's a 4 by 4 matrix, which all of our transformation matrices are. And all of the transformation matrices are based around the identity matrix. Okay. But in this case, on the right-hand uh, column, we have the tx, qi, tz. Now, if we multiply these two together, you can see that's our column vector. And it, all it does is just moves the x coordinates by tx, y coordinates by ty, etc. If we didn't have a four element coordinate, um, homogeneous coordinate, we wouldn't be able to apply this. So that's why we need homogeneous coordinates. Okay, uh, scaling. Scaling actually is he uh, moving a point further away from the origin? Yes. So we're scaling, we're not actually sort of, um, if you have an object and you want to scale it up or down, it's not simply a case of just multiplying by the scaling uh, matrix. You have to first move your objects to the, um, to the origin. Okay, and essentially all we're doing with scaling is we're multiplying the x, y, and z coordinates by some scaling factor, sx, sy, and sz. Okay, so our scalar matrix is probably the simplest of a lot. It's just the identity matrix, but the first three ones, so to speak, are SF, SY, and SZ. Multiply it by your coordinates, and you get the scaled coordinates. Okay, and um, the perhaps the most sort of complicated, and the one which I always forget. I'm always having to look these up. Or sort of um, derive, <coughs> I should say. Rotation. <coughs> now, what we want to do with rotation is we want to rotate a point around the origin. Okay. So the simplest case here is we have a point which is on the s axis, and we want to rotate it by some angle. I've called this angle phi or phi. Okay, around a circle of radius r. 
Okay, so it starts there. If I rotate it at a small angle, I'll end up here. And that's my transform point. Okay, so using straightforward trigonometry, okay, if I was to drop the line down there and form a right angle triangle, okay, my x prime coordinate will be the adjacent side, and my y prime coordinate will be the um, opposite side. So remember, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. I rearrange that, we get r cos phi, and the y coordinate will be r sine phi. Now, if our point starts on the x-axis, then this distance, of the adjacent side, must be the radius. Okay. So the x coordinate, sorry, it must be the radius. So I can replace r cos phi by x cos phi and r sine phi by x sine phi. Okay, so that's rotation, that's the idealized case. That's a case where we have the point already on the x axis. That's rarely gonna happen, if ever. Okay, usually we're gonna have a point somewhere else and we're gonna to need to rotate it. So in this case, let's say we already have our point here, which isn't on the x axis, and we again wanna rotate it by angle theta about the origin. <coughs> so what we can say here is, starting at x, y, I'm rotating, remember r is still the uh, radius, by an angle which is phi plus theta. So let's say we start it here and rotate it about an angle phi plus theta to get to there. And I use my double angle formula. Okay, so cos of phi plus theta, equal to cos of phi times cos of theta, minus sine of phi times sine of theta. I never remember those, I'm always looking at my Okay, so this is, do you remember the double angle formula? No one ever does, because it's something you do in A level and don't forget. So, okay, but, all, all I've done there is that, imagine x, y was on the, um, on the x axis, and I'm just rotating by <coughs> phi plus theta. Okay, so um, use the angle formula, okay, multiply out. The r cos theta from the previous slide was equal to x dash, and r sine theta is equal to y dash. Okay, so x dash and y dash, in this case we've got x and y, so we have x cos theta minus y sine theta. And if you do similar for the y dash, we get something to accept the, um, it's x sine theta plus y cos theta. Okay. So that's why you have that general pattern, cos minus sine, sine cos. So the rotation matrices, okay, it gets a bit confusing because there are three different directions of rotation. Okay, the way I choose to remember it is all these three are based around the identity matrix. And the one you don't want to change, so for example, if we're rotating around the x direction, we don't want to change the x point. So the first row um, is the same, and we want, we're changing the y and z coordinates. Okay. Most common mistake, and I'm always making this, what I tend to do is guess and then see if we give you the right answer if it goes that change. Not, not a great mathematical way of doing it, but it works. Okay, it's always cos, sine, sine, cos, it's just where is this negative? In, around the x direction, it's in the bottom left. Around the y and z, it's top right. Okay, like I say, if you remember one of them is negative, do it, does it give you the right answer? If it doesn't, change it. Oh, these always assume we go anti-clockwise in the rotation. If you want to go clockwise, you just Either you change the sign of your theta, or you change the sign of your sign with an extra function. Um, just going to finish off. This is a sort of I've almost done like about seven weeks of two and one in just one sort of half hour bit. But just to finish off, when we apply these, what we have is we have our um, matrix, which is our coordinate matrix, which is x, y, z, 1, 
but no subtransposed, so it's a column vector. Now, in all of these examples so far, I've used a single uh, column, but we can extend this to n. We can have thousands or millions of columns here. As long as it's four by n, we can apply it in a single matrix modification. Okay, so our transformed coordinates are simply whatever our transformation matrix is times whatever our coordinate matrix is. The thing to remember is the order with which we multiply them matters. Okay, so in this case, this means I'm doing transformation one first to my point, then I'm doing the second one, then I'm doing the third one. So when it comes to rotation and translation and scaling, it matters what order they're in. In practice, what we tend to do is we combine all of our transformation matrices into a single matrix. We tend to refer to as A, and then we just it's just a single multiplication. Um, yeah, just, just I mentioned about the order, just to sort of tell you about what happens geometrically speaking. Okay, let's say we've got this polygon, okay, and we're scaling it. About the origin, if you state it about the origin, it just moves all of the four vertices just further away from the origin. <coughs> if we, so there we go, that scales it. If we'd scale it, an object not centered at the origin, all it would do is move the four vertices further away, but it also moves your object. So if you want to scale your object up or down, you have to make sure it's at the origin. If you rotate an object, okay, about the origin, that's fine, just rotate onto an axis. But if your object was not centered at the origin and you rotated it, you also have the effect of moving it. Sometimes you want that to happen, sometimes you don't. And translation, that's fairly straightforward, you just move and watch an object from one place. Right, I think we Yeah, before I go on to that. Okay, um, any questions? Hopefully that was all just revision, straightforward. Okay, um, I'll see you at 2 o'clock then. Did everyone sign I don't I don't